Good morning. It's good to be with all of you again this morning. You come to join me for this interesting experiment I rode this morning with my daughter Natalie. Glad to have her with me. Um, but I did not bring my car where glasses are, reading glasses. So I'm going to stand back here a little bit and we'll see if I can see everything and see if it makes sense this morning together. Uh, I thought this morning we'd talk about um, an interesting phrase that we find in, uh, in the Gospels. And uh, it's always interesting to me as you look at how, the, how things are written, that, that sometimes there are little nuances that you find that this is a message. And, uh, and I thought maybe we would think about that this morning, this phrase that we find uh, in the Gospels. A friend of mine who's, who's a preacher, uh, maybe you know Donnie Rader, had this thought and uh, let me share this with you as well. I think it's interesting to, to think through as we, we consider that. You know, we, we read this morning in, in the Bible about those who had decided to follow Jesus in our scripture reading this morning and uh, the apostles following after him. And we just sang a song about our Redeemer lives. And so we know who Jesus is and, and that he called those to follow after him. And I want to think about this idea of following at a distance and what the, the scripture says about that for a few minutes. You know, many of us identify with the apostle Peter. Um, one of the things that, that's fascinating as you look at all of those that Jesus called to follow him to be his apostles, the, the great diversity that was there amongst uh, the different men and the different things that they did, the different occupations they had, the different personalities that they had. And, and many people think about Peter and identify with him because uh, you know, sometimes of his impatience, sometimes of his boldness, sometimes of his uh, impulsiveness. Um, and there's a lot of people, like myself, that can relate to that and relate to him. And, uh, and the kind of person he was. And so we want to think about that as we can kind of consider some things that we see him uh, saying. And you know, here in Matthew chapter 26 and uh, beginning in verse 30 is, we think this morning a lot of this is surrounding Jesus' arrest in the garden and, and his, his trial before his crucifixion and, and what we see, or how we see rather, the apostles deal with that. Here in Matthew 26 and verse 30 it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. It was verse 33, as we think about Peter here and his reaction towards things. It says, And Peter answered him, Though they all fall away, because of you I will never fall away. Here we might think of that, that brashness that Peter had, that, that impulsiveness sometimes of, of quickly, quickly acting. But as we think through that, we see Peter first here boldly proclaim uh, his devotion to the Lord. But then, as we read some things later that happen after Jesus' arrest, a couple of different places in, in, the four, in the three, at least three of the four Gospels, it talks about him, this phrase, following at a distance. In Matthew chapter 26 and, and verse 57, a little bit later after this proclamation has been made, we find this, it says that those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders had gathered, and Peter was following him at a distance. As far as the courtyard of the high priest, going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. And just think about some of the phrases that we'll read through here and maybe how those relate to what, what Peter did. In Mark 14, in verse 53, it says there, Mark records it, it says, They led Jesus to the high priest, and the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, and Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. I think it's interesting as you look through the Gospels that that even though you have four different writers of the Gospels, they all make this comment in some way, or most of them make this comment in some way. Now, John doesn't say it as specific in John 18 and verse 15, but notice what he notes about this. It says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did uh, another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest, but Peter stood outside the door. And so the other disciple that was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watching the door and brought Peter in. So same idea here, just not the exact same words that, that are used. And so let's think through that for a few minutes. Why is it that this is noted? And why is it that, that Peter does this? That the reasons maybe that he follows at a distance. That's the first thing let's think about together. And as we consider that, well, you know, perhaps it was a fear of a close association association with Jesus at this point. When you think about what's going on here, Jesus had been arrested. Perhaps Peter thinks, well, 
maybe I'll be arrested if I'm too close to him. Jesus was on trial. Maybe there's a fear that, that Peter would be on trial too if he was too closely associated with Jesus. And so they're threatening to kill Jesus. And if you imagine this situation where you've got, you know, members of uh, people who are close to the government, not the Romans, the Romans themselves involved in some way, but the, the Jews and that political uh, entity there that, that the, the Herod is allowed to interact with the Roman government and, and how all that is going together, you know, and they're threatening to kill Jesus. Peter could be killed too. And maybe all those things are on his mind as he kind of stays back uh, and watches what is happening here. It's ironic, though, um, based on what Peter had said earlier in Matthew and Luke about his loyalty to Jesus. I think that's interesting. When you look at some of these passages in Matthew 26 and verse 33, Peter answered and said to him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Or, or what Luke records there in 23 and 22 and 33, Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Some pretty bold statements there that Peter's making. But yet, now when we say, as the rubber meets the road, and they have Jesus, and they've captured him, and it's, it's, we might say it's getting kind of real here, isn't it? You know, they've got him. They've got him in the middle of the night in this council. They're all gathered around him. They've captured him. And now Peter is kind of following in the distance. Uh, as we look through this this morning, what I want to do is, is basically make some application to the things that can happen to us as well. We can be like Peter. Sometimes we can make bold proclamations. Sometimes we can stand out and say certain things, but then what happens sometimes when it gets real, you might say. Um, this can happen to us too. You know, maybe we have a fear of expecting uh, to be too closely involved. You know, if you think about, you know, Peter's involvement here and, and his close association with Jesus, if he maintains that or he proclaimed that or he embraced that at this moment and we've talked about maybe what that could mean for him what does that mean for us you know if i'm closer with the lord's people then you know maybe they're going to expect me to be involved with things just like peter would expect that he might get involved with things here um you know that that means if i'm too close sometimes i might think well that means i have to have a greater connection it means a greater scrutiny of my life um, so maybe I'll, I'll be part of the Lord's people, but I'll, I'll kind of keep a comfortable distance. I'll sit over here. I'll, I'll show up when I need to show up to, to not maybe raise any red flags, but I don't want to be too close because that means people are going to look at what I'm doing or people are going to look at my life more closely. You know, there could be some, some things that I don't want to give up. Maybe there's certain practices or certain friends or certain relationships that we have, and I don't want people to look too closely at that. I don't want too much scrutiny there. If I'm closer to the Lord, that, that might lead to a higher standard than I have now. Have you thought about that? We want to we sing songs about drawing close to thee, and we talk about being close as brethren. We read in the New Testament about how they came together in their houses with each other and prayed together and thought about the kingdom and the things that they could do, and when there was persecution, um, even when they were scattered, the word went abroad teaching. If we're too close to the church, if we're too involved as God's people, then that might bring some scrutiny to us. We might have to change how we do things. And so sometimes we can think about that, that we might have a, some standards maybe that we don't want to give up or our standards aren't the same as what we think the words would be. And so sometimes we follow at a distance. And uh, But we want to think about what it means as we look through things and as we see the apostles embrace these things, and as we see Jesus teach about them, what does it mean to follow Jesus wherever he goes? Luke mentions that in Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. It's an interesting passage at the end of Luke chapter 9 that, that I've always looked at and thought, you know, it takes courage to be a Christian when you think about what Jesus says here. And, and Luke 9 and verse 57, as Jesus is walking along and and others are following him. This is recorded for us. It says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Think about what Jesus is saying there. If you're saying you're going to follow me wherever you go, then that might mean you don't have the kind of home that you're used to or the kind of stability that you're used to. You know, the Son of Man has a mission. He has work to do. He has things that, 
that he's involved in, if you're gonna follow me wherever you go, that might mean you give up some stability or some of those things that are close to you. Verse 59, he says to another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I think, well, that's a strange thing to say. Let the dead bury the dead. But, but what's Jesus saying there? In a nutshell, he's saying, you know, that following after him has to come before other earthly relationships. That it's more important to follow him and to, to put that purpose first than some of the things that we might feel responsible to do here. It's not denying responsibility, but but the, the kingdom of God comes first. He goes on to say there in, in verse uh, in 61, Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say well to those who are at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And again, Jesus is speaking figuratively here in a lot of ways uh, to emphasize the importance of closely following him and of being involved in the kingdom that way. So following Jesus closely takes a commitment, it takes courage. Um, and what we see here, uh, at least at this moment in time with Peter, following at a distance means something different. We have to think about what that means in our lives today as well. Um, think back about Peter again in this, this situation here. You know, the reasons that he follows at a distance. Well, he might be, you know, deceiving himself into thinking, well, you know, at least I'm still following the Lord. And, you know, when you think about the situation and what happened that, that we read earlier in some of those passages, all the other disciples scattered, um, it says in, in some of those passages. So at least Peter and John are still following in some way. That, that's true. Think about what Mark 14 tells us there. It says, and Jesus said to them, you know, as they're coming to arrest him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scripture be fulfilled. And verse 50 says, and they all left him and fled. So true, all the disciples did flee, but at least Peter and John are following in some way. And, you know, as you think through this, sometimes do we do that? Can we think that way or have that mindset too? Well, I haven't abandoned Jesus altogether. I'm, I'm following somewhat. You ever living a certain way or doing a certain thing and your conscience is bothering you a little bit but then to soothe it you know we kind of say well you know at least i haven't done this or this you know we kind of start putting degrees on sin sometimes and say well I, i'm not this bad or i haven't done this or at least i'm still making it to services every now and then or at least i'm still you know you fill in the blank how does that attitude affect us today i'm here but i'm not involved you know uh, I'm a member, I come through the door at least once a week. Um, at least I'm not, you know, as Peter might say, at least I'm not like the other disciples and fled. I'm, I'm at least wanting to see what's happening here. You know, I give, I sing, I pray, I, uh, I read the emails, uh, I speak to others on my way in or out. I, I know for the most part what's going on. I support those who take part. But you see the difference between following at a distance and being closely involved with the Lord. What if some of these disciples, what if things had gone differently? What if as they came and took Jesus away, they stood up and said, no, if you're going to take him, you've got to take me too. This is my Lord and Savior. How might that have looked different? And think about our commitment today to him. You know, So Peter might have thought, you know, at, least I'm, uh, at least I'm with some others who are also following, not just uh, going as far as some would go and, and not follow him at all. Well, we think more about this here, you know, that he ignored the warnings, though, of following Christ at a distance. And I think, well, when did Jesus warn him about that? Well, consider some of these passages that came before this incident occurred. Back in Matthew 26 and verse 30, it says, you know, when they had sung a hymn, when they went to the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to them, he told them what was going to happen, didn't he? He says, you will fall away because of me for this night, uh, and, quotes this, and quotes this passage. Um, so they were warned that something was going to happen and they should, you know, prepare themselves for that. And Peter ignored those warnings and just followed at a distance instead. He was warned that, that he would deny the Lord. Have you ever thought that through? Um, and there in uh, Matthew 26 and verse 34, Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, 
even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. So you think about the, the things that happened that night and, and how Jesus prepared them for what was going to happen. And when the rooster crowed once, if you consider that, that really should have shook Peter to his core, shouldn't it have? Because of what he was told. Mark 14 and records it this way in verse 66. And Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you were also with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know or understand what you mean. And he went out to the gateway and the rooster crowed. Can you imagine what that might have felt like? I mean, hopefully what came roaring back to him was Jesus just told me this was and so, when we think about the warnings that he had uh, of what, what was going to take place, you know, really Peter kind of ignored those and, and followed at a distance. Well, what about us? We're trying to make some application for these things. Um, you know, what, have, have you ignored warnings maybe that have come to you about others, when others have encouraged you to follow the Lord more closely? Have you thought about what others might have said to encourage you or, or ever noticed your commitment failing? When you start thinking about how much time you're spending with things and you, you realize, well, you know, it's been a while since I prayed very regularly. Uh, you know, other than bowing my head quickly before I, I eat a meal out of habit because I feel like I really need to do that, you know, how do you stop and spend time in prayer with God to draw closer to Him? Have you noticed that? waning away? Have you noticed that your time in the Word of God has drifted off? Those might be signs that you're starting to, to follow at a distance. Don't ignore the warnings that we see uh, throughout the Bible about how we not need to draw ourselves closer to God. If you spend more time stressing out over work or school or things in the world than, than thinking about maybe things that need to happen for the Lord or situations that you need to involve yourself in there. Well, different things like that are warnings that maybe we're starting to follow at a distance. Don't, don't wait for that proverbial rooster to crow a second time before it's too late for you. Think about how you can draw closer to God and not follow at a distance. Well, you know, there's something else we think about is, is you know, reasons that he might be following at, at a distance is that he had maybe forgotten the commitment that he had made back in Matthew 16 and, and the verses that came after that. It's easy to make a commitment. It's easy to make promises and proclamations about things when times are not stressful and when there's not a situation at hand. It's easy to say, I'm going to do this. It's easy to say, I'm going to make sure I uh, spend more time in prayer or I'm going to do this for the Lord's people. Or, I'm going to commit to this when there's not a stress involved. And, and Peter did that as well when you, when you consider some of the passages that we look at there. They, they had to learn... Um, that, you know, they, they have to uh, be able to, to follow up on the things that, that they said that they would do. You know, Peter said uh, back in Matthew 16, and, and you look at those verses there, you know, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So Jesus, it seems like, was pretty clear with them what was going to happen. Verse 22, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. We talk about the boldness or the brashness of Peter. It's because of statements like this, that Jesus, the master, the teacher, the son of God, whom Peter has seen perform miracles, tells him this is what's going to happen. And Peter's taking him aside and basically telling him, no, he's wrong. Uh, I've used this example before. This, this kind of makes me think of, you know, you've got uh, maybe some, some parents with a couple of kids, and you've got one that's acting up, and he's, he's crying, and the parent's trying to deal with the situation. Maybe you've seen that. And, and they've got multiple things going on. It's getting kind of stressful. And, and you know, somebody who's uh, a pretty young person that doesn't have kids comes up to him and taps him on the shoulder and says, ah, you're, you're handling this the wrong way. And you just kind of look at that situation and think, you have no idea <laughs> what is happening here, do you? 
And here's Peter coming and telling Jesus, no, this isn't what's going to happen. And what happens there? In verse 23, Jesus rebukes him. He says, he turned to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Well, Peter's commitment to, to Jesus here, and, and in some of the other passages that we read, like in, like in Matthew 26, 33, though they all fall away, I will never, because of you, I will never fall away. It seems like Peter has forgotten that commitment at this point of things, as he's watching Jesus be tried by this Jewish council and wondering what's, what's going to happen. And the thing is, this commitment that he made to Jesus was just hours earlier, you know, that we're reading here in Matthew 26. It wasn't that long ago that he made this commitment that I will never fall away. And so let's not be like Peter in that way. Let's, let's think about that. We make a commitment when we obey the gospel that we're going to, to follow Jesus, that we're going to be a disciple of Christ, that we're going to be a light, that we're going to be salt, that Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16. That those are the kinds of things that we're going to do, that we're going to say, maybe as Paul did in Galatians 2 and 20, you know, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That I've crucified, you know, my, the, I've crucified myself to the flesh and going to follow after those things. Let's not forget that. As Peter seemed to hear in this moment of, of stress. What Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you committed and that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. Let's not forget the commitment that we make in that way. Let's not follow at a distance, but, but follow closely to God no matter what it is that's going to happen. Well, as you think through this scenario, you know, there are some dangers um, to following the Lord at a distance. And let's consider a few other things, just little phrases that we see are ha that are happening here as, as this situation unfolds. You know, when you, when you follow at a distance, it leads to other sins. That's an interesting thought to, to consider. Um, you know, instead of being right up there, as I've mentioned, with Peter, right up there with Jesus and the guards that are carrying him away and saying, this is my Savior, I'm with him. He's following in distance, and that leads him to do other things that he normally would not have done. We see Peter lie a few times during this situation. Look here in Matthew 26 and verse 70. It says, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. This is when they were asking him, aren't you with him? I mean, is that true? Does Peter know what they mean? Certainly he does. And it says, and he went on out to the entrance. Another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystander, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. I mean, come on. <laughs> How would that feel to you? For someone, a brother or sister in Christ or a family member, somebody who's close to you, and, you know, trouble comes. We don't live in that kind of government right now at this time and place, but what if you did? What if you live, we lived there where you could be oppressed for that and somebody grabs a hold of somebody close to you and they look at you and say, are you with them? Somebody that's been a good friend or a close brother and you look at the, the person that they have a hold of you and go, I don't know who that is. Can you imagine how that would feel? And that's what happened here. Verse 72, again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you two are one of them, but your accent betrays you. And he began to evoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know the man. Immediately, the rooster crows. So you think about that situation. You think about what following in the distance is trying to stand back leads to. It leads to, to other things. Um... It led to a failure of his faith in this situation. You see that as Luke talks about, you know, this, this same account here. Um, you know, you read what, what Luke says here, it's kind of basically the same thing. He, he gives a few different details there in verse 57. He denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. Someone else draws near, and he also and says, you are also one of them. And, and he says, man, I am not. And after, here's what is interesting, after an interval of about an hour, Still another insisted, saying, Certainly, this man was also one of them, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crows. I bring this one up because and we'll come back to this in a little bit too. The, the idea of an hour has passed. He's had some time to think about this. 
time to settle in a little bit of what's happening. It's not just that this just happened and he didn't know what to do in the moment. Some time has passed. So, you know, we're surprised, if you think about it, we're surprised when someone who is close to the Lord and following him closely, um, you know, that you and I can see that in their life, uh, we're surprised sometimes when they fall away to worldliness. And it's a shock to us. But we're not usually surprised when we see someone who's usually on the peripherals and who don't, doesn't follow the Lord that closely, when we see them give into worldliness or, or we, we kind of expect sometimes that, oh yeah, I can see how that would happen. My point about that is, as you think through this, if we're following God closely, if we're trying our best to be all that he wants us to be, uh, it's going to be more difficult for us to, to be pulled away. But when we see people who um, just, you know, they're not really professing their faith, they, they, they don't really have strong commitment, and we see something happen, it's not surprising, is it? And, and that's the point that, that we want to think about here. It's not surprising when we, we see, you know, people who don't follow the Lord very closely engage in things that are unbecoming to, um, to a Christian or to, to what God would ask of us. Uh, and so that's something that we need to think about as we think about following God. You know, one of the other dangers of following the Lord as a distance is that it's even to go, it's easy to go even farther. If you're already at a distance, then it's easy to separate yourself even more. Look at what it says here in Matthew 26. We're pulling some of these phrases out of these larger passages here. You know, he went out to the entrance and another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, you know, this man was, was with Jesus of Nazareth. So remember, he's already denied him once. Mark tells us that when that happened, he says he denied it, saying, I neither know or understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway where the rooster crowed. It's interesting the phrasing that's there in Mark. I neither know or understand what you mean. He's really pulling back. He's going further than just saying, well, no, I don't know. He said, I don't even know what you're talking about, we might say today, uh, as, you, as you look at that situation. So when we are already at a distance, it makes it easier to put a further gap between us and the Lord. Think about it this way. It talks here, as you look through some of the, the phrasing of this situation, trying to put together exactly what's happening. And apparently Jesus was in a different, uh, in a room, and, and Peter was looking on in that. And at some point, John comes and gets him and, and brings him closer to, to what's happening. But Peter spends some time over here by the fire with the guards and with others as he's watching to see, you know, what's, what's going to happen. What would Peter have said, you wonder, if he was sitting right there beside Jesus? Do you think he would have offered the same denials? I don't know who this guy is. Uh, I don't even understand what you mean. And, and the point is, if we're close to God, if we're right there beside him, if we're in step with what, we're, with what he wants us to be and what we're doing, that's a strengthening thing to us. It makes it a lot harder to deny. It, it, uh, it, it, it builds us up in, in strength to, to get through trials. If you're sitting right there beside the Lord, um, it's easy to see how close you are. But the further away and the further away that you get, um, the more the distance is, the easier it is to go further away. And that, that's the point that I want us to see from there. Um, if you go a little further, Who's really going to notice? I've already gone this far. What's a little further? And we do that sometimes, don't we? In life with different things. I use my favorite example. I like to eat food. Too much of it. And as I try sometimes, like I'm trying now to focus on it, one of the things, one of the big fall downs with that is, you know, if I, I'm doing really good, I've been doing good for, for a week or weeks or days or whatever, and, you know, something happens that I have something that I probably shouldn't have had. You know, let's say it happens in the morning or, or at lunchtime. And what happens at dinner time that night? I'm like, well, I've already blown today. I might as well, I might as well go ahead and, you know, I'll have some ice cream tonight or something like that. I already blew it, right? Instead of, no, I made a mistake, but, or I went off program, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick, get back to what I need to get back to. So once we take a step back, it's easier to take the next one and easier to take the next one. The further away you get, the easier it is to step away. Um, and that, that's something to, to think about. You know, the, the, the Hebrew writer tells us there not to do that. That whole 
book of Hebrews talks about dealing with persecution and not going back to the old ways and, and, and staying true to Christ and that he is the way. But think about how the Hebrew writer talks about that in several places. In Hebrews 3, verse 12, Take care, my brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. In other words, don't get further away from Jesus. Don't go back to the old way of thinking, but rather stay, uh, stay tuned in. You know, the warning is that you could lose your faith altogether if you don't draw closer to Christ. Um, and, and you could come to the point of, of deciding you just don't believe in, in who he is and what he can do. You know, the writer goes on in Hebrews chapter 6 says, For is it impossible for in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own heart and holding him up to contempt. There's a whole lesson in and of there, itself there in that passage. But, but generally what he's saying here is if you reject Jesus, and you're not going to accept that, then there's really no place else for you to go. Um, and so the further away you get from accepting who he is and what he has done, then uh, you're just going to crucify him again, and there's not, there's not going to be any hope for you. And if we go on sinning willfully or sinning deliberately, meaning we just keep stepping away, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. It's not saying we can't come back to Jesus, but if that's who you're rejecting, there's not another way. There's not another path. And so that's something for us to, to keep in mind, to think about. You know, getting further and further away, sometimes there is no coming back. That's the danger of following in the distance. Let's finish up with these thoughts, the signs that we might be following at a distance. Think about what Peter's been doing here and think about what we might do as well got this phrase here, warming ourselves by the fire. You think about what, what it tells us here about the situation that Peter's facing. In Mark 14, verse 44, Peter had followed him, and had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Luke says it this way in Luke 22, 55, and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And just think about the situation here, okay? They took Jesus and are having a trial, um, and Peter is choosing to warm himself by the fire where the servants of the high priest are, the enemies of Christ. He's not choosing to say, no, no, I'm, I'm with him. He's choosing to stay back. He's, he's warming himself by the fire of those who are around, uh, who are the enemies of Christ. Luke says that Peter sat among them for an hour mentioned that a minute ago. You read on there in verse 56, a servant girl uh, sat closely to him and starts asking about who he is in verse 59 and after the interval of an hour still another insisted those things as they think about it. So it wasn't just that he walked up to see what was going on. He's standing there for a few minutes by the fire, you know, noticing um, and, and moving on and trying to do something about things. No, he's there for at least a period of time. This this is what we know, is at least an hour. I don't know how long exactly it was. He's not bothered at this point, it looks like, by being among the enemies of Christ, those who are putting his Savior on trial. And so when we are spending time in and among um, people of sin, we're following the Lord in the distance. Now let's put that in perspective and, and, and context. You know, when we find ourselves warming ourselves by the devil's fire, you might say, you know, that's a sign that we might be starting to follow the Lord at the distance. What does that look like today? Um, you know, we, we, we see physically what it looked like here. What does that look like metaphorically, you might say, for us today? You know, are we putting ourselves in positions where we're spending more time with the world than we are with the people of God? Now, I know we can read passages like 1 Corinthians 5, and, and where Paul talks about the you know, to get out of the things that are happening in the world, we have to go outside the world. But yes, we, we live and we work among people who are who are here, but we don't have to be part of those things. We don't have to take on those things. We think about our social life or even our social media life. What are we participating in when we think about our work or our school or our neighborhood organizations? You know, are 
are we showing by the things that we approve of or the things that we're okay with or the things that we're just not going to say something about that we're enemies of Christ? Or are we standing strong for the things that he would have us stand strong for? Things that we take into our hearts, the time that we spend with different things. Are we showing that we are enemies of Christ, that we're standing at a distance, that we're going to warm ourselves by the devil's fire? When you turn on the streaming things on, on television or where you decide what you're going to spend your free time doing, are you standing back and warming yourselves by the fire of the world? Or are you trying to draw closer to Christ? There's some things to think about there. We don't want to spend our time sitting amongst the enemies of God when we could be standing strong for his purpose and for, uh, for his cause. So, you know, that's one sign that we might think about. Are we following at a distance? You know, also, maybe when we recognize that we'd be more comfortable with the world than uncomfortable with the Lord. That's an interesting way to, to think about it, isn't it? If I'm more comfortable with the world than being uncomfortable with the Lord. And John, or, and you think about the, the, the influence sometimes that the world can have. I remember, you know, the, this idea of Lot and pitching his tent towards Sodom because that's where the things were that he wanted to be a part of. But also, you know, consider what it says here in John chapter 18 and verse 18. Um, as John writes about some of these things, he says, Now the servants and officers made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves, and, and Peter was warming himself too. And just bring this up again because all of the Gospels talk about this fact, that, that, that Peter decided you know, to do that. It was more comfortable to stand there by the fire at a distance and kind of watch what was going on than it would have been to be sitting there right beside the Lord thinking about what was happening, being a part of it, being committed to uh, being involved with trying to defend his Lord and Savior. And that's something for us to think about, too. Rather than agreeing to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations sometimes, we sometimes choose what is comfortable, but as it is at more of a distance from God. Sometimes those things that we might choose are not necessarily wrong in and of themselves. It's not wrong for Peter to want to be warm. It's not wrong for him to want to be comfortable. But here's Jesus in a difficult situation, and Peter could have chosen something different. And so when we are just as close or closer to people of the world than we are to our brethren, then are we following the Lord at a distance? Also, when we're more comfortable with people of the world, uh, and we would choose that rather than choosing to be with the people of God. Are we following Jesus at a distance? When our attitude towards our brother is that, you know, that we like them well enough and we know we're supposed to love them, but we don't love them dearly, it's kind of a take it or leave it relationship. Hey, I'll, I'll see it a couple of times a week. Are we following Jesus at a distance? When you think about some of the careless attitudes sometimes that, um, that, that can be had with that and some of the things that, that, G, that Peter did because of that. You know, he sat for an hour amongst those who had their minds on doing something like killing Jesus and he didn't seem to be bothered by it. And, you know, he, he sat there to, to uh, consider what was going to happen or some would say, well, he was just trying to see what was going to happen and, and make a decision about it. Um, but, you know, we recognize from how Peter dealt with the fact that he realized he had denied the Lord later as he wept bitterly that that's not what he was doing. Uh, he was afraid and he didn't stand up for Jesus as he should have. And so we consider then how we might justify sometimes that decision. In Matthew 26 and verse 58, Peter was following in existence as far as the courtyard of the high priest and going inside, he sat down with the guards to see the end. He wants to see the end. He wants to see the outcome. But he should have known what that outcome was, right? Because Jesus already told him back in Matthew 16 that we read uh, earlier that, that they were going to kill him and that there was going to be a resurrection after that. And so when we think about how he, he approached that and how that might apply to us, uh, one commentator named Lindsay says this. He says, you know, we always invent good reasons for doing what we ought not to do. I thought that was interesting, you know. As, as Peter thinks about this, why don't you get up and go in and be with the Lord uh, and say that you're with him instead of standing back um, and being a spectator about what's happening. 
And the application for us is pretty simple. We don't want to be a spectator for what's happening in our religious life and in our faith and our devotion to God. Uh, we want to be, if we want to be called Christian, then we need to be involved in those things, to be a follower of Christ and to show people what it means to live a life that's following after him. I'll leave you tonight with this quote from, from or this morning, this quote from Matthew Henry uh, about this. It's, it's interesting as commentators have looked at this, that they see the same thing as well. Matthew Henry says he followed him, but it was truly only to see the end. Led more by curiosity than conscience, he attended as uh, he attended as an idle spectator rather than a disciple. I thought that was interesting that this commentator said that. A person concerned. He should have gone in to do Christ some service or to get some wisdom or grace to himself by observing Christ's behavior under the under his sufferings, but he went only to look about him. And you know, and the point here is that you know, even if he went in and could have done nothing. He would have gained strength from that experience. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we follow Jesus more for curiosity rather than conscience? And so as we think through those things, and oops, going backwards, sorry. <laughs> we think through those things, I'll leave you with this passage as we end our, our thoughts this morning. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We've talked about this before, verse before. Being yoked together with Christ. Come to him. Be a part of who he is. Have a relationship. Follow closely. If you're yoked together with him, you put that burden on together, you're going to pull together for the things that are needed to be done, and you're going to be close to him. And I encourage you to, to think about all those things this morning. As you Consider your standing before God. Is there something that you need to change? You need to get closer. You need to follow Him more closely. Can we help you with that this morning as we uh, as we end the, our thoughts and, and pray together with you for that? Or if you have a need to be baptized in Christ, can we help you with that as well? Let us know how we can help you in any way. Come to the front as we stand and sing this song. Whosoever hereth shall, shall the sound. Friend.